Welcome, I'm glad you're here to worship with us as we navigate ongoing challenges and for some increasing hardship. It is especially good that we have set aside this time to pray and for the nourishment of our souls. St. Columbus is a church on a mission to live God's love. And while our buildings are closed with you, we are alive and well. And we're eager to connect with you and help you take your next step toward life with Christ. We are um, finding new ways to connect online while we can't be together in person. So I invite you to join our interactive service at stcolumbus.online.church. You'll be able to engage in live chat and offer prayer requests throughout the service. There's no account or sign in necessary. So please join us live at 9.30 and 11 a.m. on Sundays so we can worship together. Also, next Sunday, join us at noon for a special Rector's Forum uh, with me and our wardens and the treasurer for an update on our plans for ministry this spring. And also next Sunday at 5 p.m., an online hymn sing, hooray. Check out our other opportunities online. Uh, we've got a couple of discussion groups, Love in the Time of Coronavirus, Exploring Couplehood, and one on Holy Envy, Finding God in the Face of Others, plus their Sunday School Youth Group and lots more. Thank you. Thank you for your ongoing generosity in support of the mission and ministry of St. Columbus. The world needs the love we share. You can learn more or make your gift at columba.org. But now, let's worship God together. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know you is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me, does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, 
so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Show us the way, we pray. Amen. So let's just cut to the chase. In the end, we're all going to die from COVID related or other causes. Decades from now or tomorrow, we're living creatures mortal creatures. This is how mortality works. It's not the most gentle start to your Sunday sermon, but I think it best to be clear. So that's one way to tell the story. Another way to tell the story is, in the end, God. Love eternal. In the end, we receive eternal life with God, and in eternal life with God, we all are reconciled with and love one another. Which way do you tell the story? My hunch is that most of us have come to an accommodation, holding the truth of both stories somehow. I've had quite a few conversations with people wondering which bits of the Christian teaching they really need to embrace. Does it matter if I believe in the resurrection, they might ask? And the short answer is yes, it really does. Because the resurrection opens the way to eternal life. The longer answer involves getting at what we mean by belief, which I'll address shortly. We can get stuck on problematic medieval images with heaven above, hell below, a gate in the clouds, a Eurocentric bearded God. But the essential quality is that in the end, God, love, eternal love, not end as in time, but end as in destination, as in home. Essential because this becomes the light toward which we travel. It is the hope that gives light to the path, even in the dark of night. We tend to not think about death, except, of course, for when we do, when our hearts are troubled, when the immediacy of death is before us, like during a global pandemic, or as is the case for the disciples, when Jesus is telling them of his own imminent, his own imminent death, for then they and we are really wanting some reassurance. Where are we going? When and how does this pandemic end? And since Jesus has already given the answer, I'm not spoiling anything by telling you now that the way is the end. The way we live, the way we love, the way and the end, the means and the end are one and the same. This is the essence of Jesus' good news today. We're going to God. We're living now already in the fullness of God. But I've gotten ahead of myself. I meant to begin with today, here, now, and first to name how hard this is. I, I don't need to belabor it. But with the coronavirus, we're experiencing collective trauma, marked by loss, brought about by no action of our own, a sense that things are out of our hands. This plague is not striking and hurting all communities and individuals equally, but all of us can name the ways that we feel profound loss. I don't know about you, but I find the feeling of loss ebbs and flows. Some days are okay, then out of the blue. The next moment, I feel really sad. And let me pause here to say how crucial it is for our emotional and spiritual well-being to give ourselves space to feel our feelings. 
and if you're inclined to pray, to bring those feelings with you into God's loving, healing presence. We can and we will move on, but we need to honor our grief and be sad when we're sad. In addition to the loss is the uncertainty, the unknowability of it all. How can we be safe? When will this end? We're all obligated to make decisions with insufficient information for ourselves, our households, and some of us for groups or organizations or businesses that we lead. We know a lot hangs in the balance with those decisions, and we'd love a map, a timeline. So I want to say that I have really appreciated spending time during the past week or more with the disciples in today's gospel. Because if anything describes their context, it's the feeling of loss and uncertainty. We're joining the disciples in the middle of a really hard conversation with Jesus. You know, he had called them some years back, called them each one by one, follow me. And that's what they've been doing or trying to do. But now he's leaving to die. The path they thought they were on, it's disappearing. And during this last supper, Jesus washes their feet, says the most important thing is for them to love one another. He's just told them that Judas will betray him, Peter will deny him, the religious authorities will crucify him. So, needless to say, they're wondering how all this is going to turn out. So when Jesus tells them that he's going to prepare a place, a heavenly habitation, a mansion, of some sort, with many rooms, safe dwellings for one and all. Their hearts, their hearts are full, and they're really eager to get the address and the root. Where is this? How do we get there? I am the way, the truth, and the life makes for lovely poetry, inspiring prayer. But as the basis for a plan of action, it feels a bit sketchy. And fast forward to those first disciples figuring it out after Jesus' resurrection, and it's still a bit sketchy. Much as they might have liked specifics, seven habits, 12 steps, 10 commandments, the way of Jesus is comprised of relationships. Relationships of compassion and justice worked out daily through our lives. Now, part of the poetic imprecision is thanks to the mysticism of John the Evangelist. John doesn't tell the story in a way that makes sense chronologically or geographically. He reveals the eternal now, where the Son is in the Father, and we are in the Son, and the way home. Well, it's not about going to a place. It is about the relationships that make that place home. It's not about where we're going a place. It's about how we'll get there. Our relationships with one another. If the end is love, the way to the end is love. If the future is life in God, the way is to live God's future now. That's what this is about, to live God's future today. This is the light toward which we travel it's the hope that gives light to the path even now in the dark of night. Belief in the resurrection implies an intellectual leap when what matters is that we practice resurrection, that we live our lives informed by, directed toward God's eternal love. Examples are all around us when we hope even during loss and grief 
when we're loving even amid uncertainty, when we are generous and compassionate even amid scarcity. When I looked for stories of those living the way, I first thought of all the remarkable people we read or hear about in the news. The EMTs and the bus drivers, the researchers and scientists, the factory workers, the farmers and sanitation workers, the parents taking care of children, the children taking care of parents, those finding creative solutions to impossible challenges. And then I thought about us and how thoroughly inspired, humbled, and truly grateful I am to be on the way with each of you. Do you know that within the first weeks, even as we each made adjustments at home, at work, at school, St. Columban's, well, created a phone tree so that scores of you making calls to parishioners who are older or live alone or may be vulnerable in some way, took the water ministry outside to continue providing food. We had to stop, so we need to look for alternate ways. We've hired a missioner to help guide us in that. We moved Sunday school youth gatherings, choir rehearsals, other small groups that many of you are guiding and leading. We led, put them all online so that we can continue to be a community, to share with one another how it is we're doing, provide one another with some spiritual nourishment. We offer daily meditations, daily prayer, daily bread. And despite financial uncertainty, we've continued giving, paying our pledges, with some advancing, increasing their gifts. We made it so that we can do church like this, with me in our parish library and you wherever you are, in a great burst of creativity. The grief is still real, and so is the hope. I may well feel sad or a bit lost later today, but at the moment, I see the light. I see the light and I'm brimful with hope. We're on the way. We're on the way with Jesus, on the way with one and all. So together, let us say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh, 
Easter season, we walk in the light of your Son's resurrection. Be with us now in this time of grief and uncertainty as we pray for those who have lost and those who will lose so much in this pandemic. Fill us with hope, compassion, and courage as we offer you these our prayers, saying, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. For your church, dispersed to the four corners of the world, that it may be a people born of your resurrection, holding fast to the ever-present possibility of new life, known to all for its unceasing acts of mercy, and ever possessed by the Spirit, boldly crying out, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. For our President and Congress, for state and local governments, and for the leaders of the world, that all those who hold power over others may be transformed by compassion and justice as they allocate resources and protect the vulnerable. May their lives and actions boldly proclaim, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. For the lonely, for the anxious, and the fearful, and those overwhelmed by their daily tasks, for the homeless, the hungry, and for those on the margins, for those who have lost their work, for those trying to work from home and care for others in their household, for those business owners and self-employed who watch as their life work or livelihood dissolves, for those who have had to make hard employment decisions, for those cut off from their loved ones in care facilities and hospitals, in quarantine and isolation. Living God, give us the strength to pray. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. For those who work so that others may receive health care, food and the necessities of life. For the scientific community, striving to understand and respond to the disease and to communicate its gravity. For the dying and those seeking healing or relief, especially Brian, Colton, Jean, Kathy, Mark, Susan, Mary Agazio, Juanita Burge, Rick Dowd, CJ Dwinell, Esther Dwinell and her family, Marian Elcano, Willie Graves, Anne Crayley, Lawrence Stamhuis, Catherine McGraw, Lynn Miller, Kathy Morrissey, Sammy Nasser, Judy Rack, Robert Reidenauer, Michael Rosenberg, Joe Ruth, Monica Schmidt, Arlette Schof, Chris Nisingho, Linda Surface, Monica Vega, Claude Villarreal, and those we name now, either silently or aloud. That God's holy presence will surround, comfort, and empower them. For all who have died, especially Juan Acosta, Carol Enright, Natalia Gorbataya, Mary Dana Loring, Elizabeth Schumann, Don Shirk, and those we name now, either silently or aloud. 
as they have been buried with Christ, may they also be raised to walk in newness of life, proclaiming for all eternity, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. Living God, give us the hope of resurrection. May we find joy in moments small and large, always able to pause and be transformed by the gifts we receive. In this Easter season, we give thanks for the new life you have of your resurrected Son and for all those who have mothered us, the birth of Olivia Rose Sedgwick, frontline workers, including janitorial workers and those who clean up our messes, the arrival of Kami Kadil, our new missioner for community engagement, those whose lives reflect a sense of resilience and hope and those blessings we name now, silently or aloud. For these gifts our hearts sing with praise. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Living God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, Look with favor and compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Life is short and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of the one who made us and loves us and goes before us be upon you this day and always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, alleluia, Hallelujah.